In the previous video, I talked about how linguistics studies the sound of human languages and how we cate categorize and analyze the way um, that the human mouth makes sounds and how we put those together into fundamental little blocks of meaning that build up words. In this video, I'm then going to talk about how chunks of sound, which we might call words or morphemes, are put together so that as we as people can say things about things. A little baby can point and say, camera, microphone, chair, desk, right? And just, just designate a thing. There it is in the world. But what if I want to say something about something? that this chair is comfortable, this microphone is on, um, clean off my computer, whatever it is, then we need syntax. We need a way of putting words together to make meaning. And in this video, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, syntax and how linguistics thinks about syntax and grammar in the broadest way and how it uses patterns of syntactic organization in order to classify different languages of the world. Let's begin. The title of this video is Synthetic and Analytic Languages. And if you can understand that distinction, then you have gone a bit of a way towards understanding the concept of sy syntax itself. So let's move it along here. Um, types of languages by syntax. The, the linguists organize the, human, the, the human, human languages into a few different kinds. One basic way that uh, language puts words to get together to make sentences uh, can be called analytic or isolating. And here, all morphemes, that is a specific chunk of meaning. Some of them might designate a thing like a water bottle. Some morphemes might designate past, like ago, right? Um, all morphemes are separate words in an analytical language, and the, the meaning of a sentence is determined entirely by, the, by word order. So in English, we say walk, I walk, so I'm walking in the present, and then we might say I walked. Now notice that little, little alveolar sound at the end, I walked. That is a morpheme that makes the meaning of that word past. Now, in a language like Mandarin and other analytic or isolating languages, um, they might just have a whole separate word that comes right after the verb that adds the quality of pastness to that. So, I walk past, if you, if you like. And so now I'm saying, I walk, that means I walked, right? This is an analytical language. You don't change morphemes. You don't combine morphemes. That's why we call it isolating. Every morpheme is its own word. Now, there are two types of synthetic languages. One is agglutinative, and this includes Japanese, uh, Bantu, um, that's a whole language family actually, Algonquian, which is an indigenous North American language, Turkish, I think, is also agglutinative, and, it, and Finnish as well. And in an agglutinative language, which is one kind of synthetic language, you combine different morphemes, but all the morphemes stay the same. So I might say in English, in the house. That's three different words. English is kind of, yeah, well, we'll get to that. Um, in, Tur in Turkish or something, you might have three separate suffixes tacked onto the word house that changes the meaning of the word house to in the house. But usually those different suffixes or those different morphemes that get tacked onto the main word don't change. They just get locked together in increasing strings without alteration. This is an agglutinative language. Now a synthetic language of the kind that we call inflectional or fusional, um, nouns and adjectives are changed by stem changes and this, the, the morphemes themselves, this, the, the words that change the original word, can both change the original word and change themselves. So when you stick different morphemes together, both of the parts of it might change into something new. This, this is a little complicated, but, but bear with me. Um, nouns and adjectives are changed by stem changes sometimes. Think about um, 
uh, geese and goose, right? We've changed the stem to indicate the concept of plural, whereas an agglutinative language might just add a, a suffix indicating that we have plural goose, and whereas an analytic language might just add another word completely saying goose more than one, right? But in English, and uh, we might say goose, geese, right? So we've changed that morpheme and it's, and it's changed the stem itself. Um, so nouns and adjectives are changed by suffixes and by stem changes to indicate case, gender, and number. And adjectives almost always agree with nouns to build nominal phrases. I'm going to translate all of that into language that is comprehensible to you very shortly if you ha don't have a lot of experience studying grammar or linguistics. Nouns and adjectives um, have affixes that indicate case, gender, and number. Verbs uh, have altered by, are altered by stem changes and or affixes to indicate tense, mood, aspect, number, and person. We're going to define those things too. But as we, are, as we already saw, we can say, I walk, we walked, you will walk, thou walkest. Oh wait, that, that morpheme, the ist ending for the second person plural, we haven't used that in English for a few centuries. All right, so let's define some terms here. What is noun and adjective case? Um, and, and a case is an inflection or sound change that indicates function in a sentence. English pronouns have three cases. Our nouns have lost cases, but we still have pronouns in cases. We have subject cases. He, she, we, they. You can't say him likes the hot dog, right? You can't say her goes to the library. Well, I mean, you can, but a native speaker will say, that's not right. Um, we have object cases, him, her, us, them, right? You like us, we like you. Us is an object pronoun. It means it has to be the object of a verb, not the subject of the verb. And we also have possessive, his, hers, its, theirs. English nouns have, have a case too. We just don't think of it as a case because of the apostrophe, but Professor Newman, Professor Newman's, right? That z, Newman's at the end there, that is an inflection. An inflection is a morpheme that is stuck onto a stem that changes um, how the word is functioning in the sentence without changing the fundamental meaning of the word. Um, in Indo-European languages and many other inflectional languages, adjectives agree with the nouns that they modify. If you've studied Spanish or French or Italian or German, you know what I'm talking about. In Spanish, we might say, um, del doño rubio, de los doños rubios. Now, we don't say the blonde gentleman or the blonde lady or, uh, in England. It, it, well, we do say the blonde gentleman and the blonde lady in English. We do not say the blondes gentlemen's and the blondes ladies in English because we've lost this feature of Indo-European. Um, Latin has it though, domini albi, dominorum alborum, domini albi, dominorum alborum. All of those mean the same thing as they do in Spanish, the blonde gentleman, the blonde lady. Um, and so these are cases, gent, the cases, subject, object, possessive. There are more cases. Um, you could also have cases that indicate uh, who's doing what, who, who uh, cases indicating direct, indirect object, cases indicating location, uh, cases indicating material, like what is this made out of? It's made out of gold. So I think Indo-European had eight or nine cases, I'm not sure. Slavic languages still maintain a huge number of cases, actually. Um, uh, all right, so what are the inflected features of Indo-European nominals? What are the number of cases? In, in Indo-European, you had a whole bunch of cases. You had a case, you could make a, uh, endings to a word that indicated it was the subject of a sentence, an object, that you were going towards something, you were going away from it, when it happened, um, in July, in the year 34, in in the summer, right? And summer, instead of saying in the summer, you'd say summer plus a piece of the word tacked on the end to indicate that it's a location in time. Um, words for exchange, words for possession, we still have that in English. Agency, who did it? It was done by whom? Well, we don't say by whom, we would just have a form of who that indicated 
that the who was doing it and instrumentation. What did you do with it? Do it with. I did it with a candlestick. I did it with a rope. I did it with poison. Sorry, I've been reading a lot of murder mysteries lately. So case is indicated by the inflection of an Indo-European noun in Latin, in Greek, in Sanskrit, in Russian, in um, German to a lesser extent, uh, in Romanian, in uh, Irish and Goidelic and Breton, members of the Celtic language subfamily of Indo-European. Inflected features of Indo-European nominals also include number and gender. We, if you've studied French or Spanish again, you've learned that, that nouns have gender in those. So like the table is feminine, but the car is masculine. And we're in English, we're like, what's that? Why is that? We only have gender and pronouns. Um, uh, and um, so uh, we as English speakers have a hard time learning languages with gendered nouns because we kind of have to dig a category into our brain just for nouns to have gender. Masculine, feminine, and neuter were the three genders that you have in Indo-European languages. But there are languages in Africa or, 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 or Aboriginal languages in Australia that have many more genders than three. There's masculine, feminine, uh, there's a gender for, for round things, edible things, animals, minerals. Like There's different ways of organizing the gender system. The word gender in Latin means Kind. It's related to the word kind, like what kind of thing is it? Um, and ours have this, an, an Indo-European gender has this rough link to what we might refer to as, as biological sex. Um, problematic concept, let's not talk about that today. Um, the other thing that Indo-European nouns inflect are um, number. And this we, we have kept to some extent in English, right? We still inflect nouns for number. Tooth, teeth. Computer, computers. Professor, professors. Goose, geese, right? And so, um, yeah, that's nouns. Actually, this video has gone on long enough, so I'm going to let you take a break, break, get a drink of water. Um, I don't know, do something fulfilling with your life. And then I'm going to do a whole other video on inflections of verbs. I can't promise I'll talk slower, but I'll pro I, 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 will, I do promise it will be shorter and just as exciting.